designer. Uh, I'm a game designer on World of Warcraft. And um, currently you have here a uh, lead producer for Overwatch, uh, lead software engineer for World of Warcraft, and myself, I'm a game designer for World of Warcraft. Um, if you're not familiar with Blizzard, uh, we have a little video to kind of give you an idea of who we are as a company. The journey began underground. Before the lights, cameras, and conventions. An unlikely assembly of heroes. Forging friendships from pages and pixels. United by a common desire to shape their own worlds. Unleashing their imaginations. Harnessing their nightmares. All in service of the epic adventure. This is your story. This is our story. Soldiers, scientists, adventurers, oddities. 25 years later, the resistance has become a revolution. Each step on our quest brought us closer to this moment. Right here, right now. One tough badass. Well played. Well played. Well played. Well played. It has been 17 years since Blizzard opened the door to a new adventure. Let's build the next 25 years together. So, good evening everybody. Woo! Probably don't want all the lights. So, first rule about game development, we don't like light. Uh, it's really, really dark, dark in the office. I'm not even kidding. Can everybody see the screen? Everybody good? Yeah. All right, awesome. Um, so, hello there. My name is Adam Gershwitz. Uh, as Sky mentioned, I'm the lead producer on Overwatch. Um, today, we've got a couple presentations for you. Uh, I'm kind of going to do the big, high level, this is how games are made, or the development process. And then uh, we have some deep dives on some other topics as well. Um, so, let's start out with what is a producer? Um, producer means a lot of different things in a lot of different industries. You've got film producers, you've got game producers, you've got project managers, you've got program managers. The short version is 
You guys saw what I was doing up here at the desktop earlier, right? I was fiddling around with stuff, trying to make things happen. Ultimately, that's the job of a producer. We get things shipped. Um, that doesn't mean we sit there on our, you know, throne of skulls and go, do it. Uh, or go to people and go, you're late, you're late, you're late. Some people do, bad producers do that. Um, what we're really there for is to facilitate communication. Um, we do get the eagle eye view of how, the, uh, how a project works. Um, you know, we work with designers, we work with engineers, we work with marketing people, we work with everybody down the chain to get a game shipped. So it puts me in a relatively unique position to kind of go, hey guys, here's how games are made, right? Um, me, myself, just a little background. Um, I started out with an engineering degree, realized I didn't want to do that, went back to school for art, started the industry as an artist, moved up to art director, switched over to production, did a little bit of design, went back to production again. Short version is I've done a lot of different things. And along the line, what I realized is I just really like making games, and I really like getting teams to make games. Uh, I know enough about engineering to be dangerous and to have bad opinions. I know enough about art to be a little more dangerous and have pretty good opinions. Um, and I know enough about design to know I'm not a great designer. But the good news is, because I've worked in all those areas, I know how to work with all those people. And that's really the key to being a good producer is to understand the folks that you're working with and to be able to knock down their barriers. Now, um, obviously, how do we make a game? Um, I'm going to date myself here, but this is a commercial that ran a long time ago. I don't know if you guys have seen the memes and everything else, but you know, there's two guys sitting on the couch going, you know, the boss is coming, producer. Um, you know, we're almost done. And she comes in, she's like, how are things going? He's like, oh, we're just tightening up the graphics on level three and just playing the game. Totally doesn't work that way. Um, but it actually has a, a, a key of truth, and I'll get to that in a moment, because they are doing the one thing that is the most important about game development, which is playing the game. Now, let's talk about spaghetti. <laughs> I know this is going to be really weird. Um, I apologize. Uh, this is made for folks his age and folks your age and folks your age and folks your age. Um, so I figure one of the best ways to say, hey, how does game development work is kind of run you guys through an exercise so you know it's actually something you already know how to do. So quick, raise your hands. Who here has eaten spaghetti? Keep them up. All right, put your hands down if you haven't cooked spaghetti before. All right, now put your hands down if you haven't added something to your spaghetti to make it your own. All right, put your hands down if you, if you haven't made spaghetti from scratch. Like, I mean scratch, like all the things, the bits and pieces. All right, so the, you guys who have your hands up, um, go to sleep for about five, 10 minutes. This is no new news for you, right? Um, but the good news is you can think about your process on how you learned how to do that and understand what that means for games. Now, how you start, I'm like, I really want to make uh, a great dinner for my family. Let's just say super important. Uh, your mother-in-law is coming, you want to impress her, or you got this girl that you really want to, or guy you really want to impress, and you want to make him a really fancy dinner. Well, the first thing you're going to do is like, crap, I don't know how to make spaghetti. What do I do? I just go to the store and I buy it, right? So step one, buy spaghetti. <laughs> Hopefully cook it, taste it, it's okay. All right, cool. I can at least do that without embarrassing myself. But I really want to impress somebody, so what's the next thing I do? Well, I don't know how to make this stuff myself, but I can add things to it. So I'm going to mod my spaghetti. Um, and I'm going to go and get maybe sausage or mushrooms, I'm just going to throw that in there and hopefully it's good, right? So you try it out, and you mod your spaghetti in different ways. Sometimes it goes very poorly. <laughs> right? I kid you not, like a spaghetti taco thing I kind of had to include because that's just freaking weird. Um, sometimes it comes out perfect and it's exactly the way you want. And that's the great thing about experimentation. Sometimes it's really, really good, right? And then sometimes you experiment on stuff and you get something really freaking weird, but it's somehow good, right? So it, it just shows that, you know, experimentation, trying things is really important, especially for something as simple as cooking, right? Then, of course, because once again, you want to impress people. And um, when it comes to game development, you need to start from scratch or else you got to pay somebody or they're going to sue you. And generally speaking, we don't like paying people or getting sued. So learning how to do it from scratch is your next step. You go through the same process there. You go ahead and you learn how to make the pasta. You learn how to make the sauce. Hopefully, the stuff you've learned from before 
you know what you want to put in it, you know how to do it, you know the basics, you know what your goal is, how you, how you want it to taste, what you want it to be like. And then ultimately, kind of get to this point after you iterate through where the next thing you know, you do the same thing with garlic bread, you do the same thing with a salad, and you know, it takes time, but you have this awesome spread out put in front of you, and hopefully the person you're looking to impress, the family, that significant other, or hell, you just really wanted to do it for yourself, you sit down and you're like, man, that was great, that was awesome. So, why is this relevant? Uh, cat says so. Um, very important. The internet says cats say so, therefore it is true. Um, but the reality is, the reason why it's important is this is how it compares. So, this is the process for making spaghetti or getting that dinner, right? You have an idea, I want to make spaghetti. First thing you do is like, I have no idea how to start. I'm just gonna try something and learn, right? So I'm gonna buy something from the store. Next thing is, I wanna make it my own. So you're gonna modify it. And then after you're like, I feel pretty comfortable with this, I'm gonna take the next day, I'm gonna make it homemade, and you've got dinner. Now the important thing is along the way, you're tasting what you do every single time, right? It's delicious, it's good, it's bad, oh my God, what did I just do? But you're trying it out, right? And you're seeing what you like and what you don't like. And you're finally hopefully settling on something that not only you like, but the people you're making dinner for like. How's it related to game development? It's the same basic thing. So this is what we refer to as kind of a core development loop. This is the type of thing you're gonna go through over and over and over again, and I'm gonna show you some examples. So you have an idea, you make a prototype, figure it out if it's fun. You don't spend a lot of time there, you just kind of get out there and try it. You iterate. Um, the, also, this is commonly known in the industry as production. Um, iteration is better, easier for everybody to understand. Once you've got it to a point where you like it, you make it really good, you make it look really good. So when people come over, like the eat at your house, it's like, oh look, it's not a sloppy plate, I got my stuff together. If people are playing your game, it's the same deal. And then eventually you release it, and you start the process all over again. So, the example I'm gonna run you guys through is actually how we made Overwatch in a, you know, let's call it the 15, 20 minute version, right? So I'm gonna talk pretty quack, that way you get quack, quick. Um, so uh, I'm the quack, this is quick. Um, so you're gonna get an idea of what's going on. So the first thing we had to do, we sat down, and I kid you not, um, my first day on the team, uh, I walked into a room and they said, what are we making, guys? And we went through this process. And we started thinking about games that we really love. And we're just gonna kind of push through this, if you can give me. So obviously we're like, well, we love Team Fortress, just keep going, and I'll talk. Uh, Street Fighter's really cool, you know, I like Battlefield, Marvel's awesome, uh, League Legends really cool. Like, and we basically looked at all of these things that we inspire. We're gamers too, right? So we love to play games, we wanna make games for us. And then ultimately said, well, okay, well we wanna make a shooter. What does that mean for us? So one of our concept artists, Ben Zhang, drew this picture for us. And this was our guiding light for our, our idea. This is our goal. We're like, what does a Blizzard shooter look like? Looks like that, guys. Or at least that's what we wanted it to look like. We wanted a bright, vibrant world. We wanted these over-the-top characters that people can acknowledge, this crazy gameplay. So we're like, great, we have a picture. Let's make it. How do we make it? Anyone? Now, that's why you're here today, right? So let's go into how we went ahead and made it. So the first thing is first, just like um, the spaghetti example, we had to try it with things that we had. So um, really important with game development, it's all about iteration and it's all about um, starting with something else to figure out what you want. You don't want to spend years building a game engine and not know the game that you want to make. You want to get out there, in your guys' case, um, use whatever existing tools you have to try your idea out and see if it's fun. In our case, we have development tools um, so we had an editor from another game that we went ahead and used. You know, we laid some stuff out. Um, next. Uh, one of our artists came over and drew us and said, hey, let me make it look like that. And we're like, that's black and white, dude. And he's like, okay, here's in color. It's magic like that. Literally, you go, that's black and white. He goes, oh, here, color. Um, totally no time involved. And then a, through the magic of presentations, we wound up with this. Right, so if you're familiar with Overwatch, this might actually look really familiar. The game actually looks like this, right? Um, but this wasn't built in the final game engine. This was built very quickly over the course of maybe a month just to prove that this is what we wanted to do.
and I can tell you the audio is really great. <laughs> Our sound guys love to put audio to inspire things. The next step is like, all right, we know what everything looks like. We need to be able to do the shooter thing and the hero thing, right? So once again, concept artists, they're great. They're like, here's the picture, make it, make it do this. We want Tracer, she's awesome. She jumps around, she flips upside down, she shoots guns, it's fantastic, right? Um, reality, there was a lot more conversations around that, but the short version is we had a design and an image. So we had kind of a recipe and a visual for us to hit. Um, so we went ahead and started this process. Just because it has awesome music too. Actually, I can talk to this. So um, we started this process and then we had to build things we didn't have before. So here's the first tracer in the game. She shoots laser beams from her eyes that you can't see and she has Mickey Mouse hands. A little later on, this is, you can see we have a timeline, just about a month later, we got her in the game engine, we put some guns into her hand, ooh, she shoots blocks, it's awesome, they're like bullets. And we do a lot of bullet shooting. And then, oh hey, another month goes by, holy crap, we have animations on Tracer where you're starting to see, she has her abilities, she's running around on the map, we can actually play a playtest that has, you know, 12 tracers in it. If you've ever played Overwatch, 12 tracers uh, is interesting, but it tells us it's fun. Uh, and, you know, this was the point when we realized, wow, this, this is something. We can go ahead and make this. So once again, next step in the loop. Okay, we have an idea what we want to make. Now we need to make more of it. We need to iterate. So what did we do? We added more heroes, right? So once again, we had a very clear vision of what we wanted. The game was all about the heroes. So we didn't bother worrying about the map. We didn't bother worrying about hero select. We didn't worry about matchmaking. We didn't worry about any of that. Because the important thing is to find the nugget of what you want to do. If you have that nugget, if you have that one thing that is the core, the guiding light of your game, and you get it right, the rest of the stuff may be hard, but you'll get there eventually, right? So just a few months later, we had this. So now you can see, once again, this is maybe a month later. I think we did this end of December, beginning of January. This is a play test where we have a couple more heroes in. We have Reaper, we have Farah, we have Widowmaker, and we have Tracer. It's all really rough. As you can see, the various people on the team are adding stuff in. Death Blossom <laughs> is a totally awesome corkscrew. I love that animation. Uh, you know, <laughs> you know, blocky hands on fair. Whatever we needed to get the get the game in and get the game feeling right. But once again, it all came down to, you know, it was fun to play, right? And once again, if I tell you guys anything, you know how you're cooking spaghetti, you're t tasting it over and over and over again. The one thing those guys got right in the commercial is they totally tightened up the graphics on level three by playing them. Well, they knew they needed to, at least. Um, so, final step, polish. So, just like these dudes here, you need to polish it to a mirror shine. The fact that we really like that doesn't mean we can sell a game that way. Well, if you're on Steam and you're early access, you can get away with it. We are not on Steam, nor are we early access. So, we had to make it look good first. So, the, the next video that I'm going to show is actually um, this is something we haven't shown very much of. Um, it's going to look kind of familiar, but kind of different. This is the first video we showed the rest of Blizzard en Entertainment and Activision Blizzard and all of our partners that said, hey guys, we have an awesome game. We want you to let us make this. So take a look. This one.
So, I have a quick question. How many people in the room have played Overwatch before? Or at least know what it is. Okay, cool. Um, leave your hands up if you've played our demo that I just showed you there. You're all liars, you've all played that. That is Temple of Anubis. It pretty much is the same as what you saw there. I think we changed one or two little routes, but that actually is the game. Um, and I think the moral of the story for this whole thing is you gotta play it, it's gotta be fun. If you can't sit down and play your game every single night, it doesn't matter how good of an artist you are, how good of a programmer you are, it doesn't mean you have a great game yet. And you should work on that and iterate on that. Um, and it's just that easy, right? You just take it one piece at a time, one bite of the pie, you get some people to help you where you need it, and you play it until it's great. The one thing that's great about games is you can have a highly polished game like that, or even a demo like that, or you can have something super simple, like Minecraft didn't start out super fantastically complicated, right? But it is a great game, and it grows alongside of you. Now, okay, we made one thing. We said, hey, the, the whole part of this thing is we told you how we'd go from beginning to end. So uh, what's the next step? You do it again, and again, and again, and again. So the next video clip I have, which we can go ahead and roll, literally just shows us doing it again. Like, we want to put in melee combat. Okay, great, cool, try it out, do it, make it right. Want to try a payload map, and that's Mercy. Looks totally like the way it does in the game right now. Um, you know, you just go again and again. We go, okay, let's make another map. And by the way, I think that is Zarya. That's our Zarya prototype. It's Farah and some random rocket launcher we made someday. You know, we made Hero Select, Hanzo, Hanzo with fingers, finger guns. Winston totally jacked. <laughs> oh, there's Reinhardt. But you know, you get the feeling, right? You put it in, you try it, you do it again, you do it over and over and over again. It doesn't matter, like if it says temp, you know, or you know, the UI doesn't look great. If it's fun, you just kind of go, you iterate, you try it again, you do it again, you play it again, you taste it over and over and over. This one's great. Yeah, that's a symmetric turret, like a teleporter. She, I think she had like ten turrets at that point. It's really overpowered. Um, this was the best she ever was, by the way. She went straightly from this to trash gear. Um, yeah, haha. -ha. Um, Genji, Genji started out with just a sword. Um, so just dragon, so imagine if Genji could dragon blade all the time. Um, really, really bad. Yeah, uh, so, okay. Uh, so then what's next? Release the game. I can do a whole like five hour presentation on what it is to go through beta, release the game, get marketing, find a publisher, all that other fun stuff. The reality of the situation is, if your game is done, if your game is polished, you'll figure out a way to get it out there. Whether you put it on Steam, or you pitch it to somebody, or you just put it up there and people start downloading it. Releasing the game, you can find people to help you with that. Making the game is kind of a passion of love, and a labor of love, I should say, and you need to do it. So you release the game. Okay, the game is out there. People love it. It's finally here. We're all done, right? Wrong. Um, we are no longer in the 80s or 90s where you go, hey, I've got my cool game on a, well, I'm gonna say CD-ROM because I'm not sure how many people know what a cartridge is. <laughs> I got my, my cool game on a CD-ROM and we're done, right? You play it and you're finished. No, we're in the golden age of the internet. People are like, what, you just made me pay 60 bucks for this and you're not gonna do more? Okay. <laughs> so what do you do? You do more. These are the guys. The game is now not yours. The game is everybody's. These are now the second most important people. Actually, maybe the first. Even Stevens. Hopefully you're a fan of your game. They're a fan of your game. These are the guys and girls out there that are going to make your game, game, game really great. You may like it, but hopefully they like it too. And You need to listen to their feedback. And you need to not always do what they say. Right? Like somebody be like, oh yeah, Symmetra's trash here, you should totally junk her. Um, what, you need to go back and think about what they say and why they say it, what their experience was, what your experience was when you were making the game and you're like, this is totally busted, I should totally not do this. And then you as the developer make the decisions, right? And you're like, you're totally hot on that, you were upset, you lost the match, I understand. Oh, that's a really good idea. And then you do it over and over and over again. 
running a live service is no different than making the game. You go, I want to try something new. You put it in, you try it again, you try it again, and you try it again. So this is a look at the first year of Overwatch and what we made. Now play. What is up, everyone? This is Jeff from the Overwatch team. We're working on a lot of things to update the game and keep it fresh. of how you make a game specifically, there's lots of things you can do to learn how to make art, or learn how to program, uh, or find whatever your niche is in games. And I'm sure when we do the Q&A, you guys are gonna have a ton of questions. But when people ask how do you make a successful game, that's the recipe. You just try, try, try again. If it doesn't work, try it again. You pick yourself up, you do it again. You do it over and over. Um, you saw all that content we put to the game. That's an extreme example. But the reality is none of those things would have happened if we didn't mod the game. We wouldn't have Lucio Ball if there wasn't a designer that's like, hey, we have cool physics controls. I think I can make a soccer game. Sure, great. Now we made a whole big event out of it. You know, uh, we didn't get uprising by going, hey, you know what would be cool? Maybe we should try doing some PVE and put some bots in. I, could, I think I can get this working. Um, and what it looks like for a big company, it's like we have all our stuff planned out and we got our part of my friend shit together. But the reality is we don't really know what we're going to make next. We just try new things. And if those new things stick, we just keep making more and more and more of it. Um, so in broad strokes, you learn two things today. One, how to make spaghetti. Two, how to make a game without actually making any assets which these guys are going to help you out with. So Monty, I think you're up next, yeah. right? <laughs> Could I have some lights on in the room? Just so I can see everyone. Yeah. 
All right, as soon as the light's gone, I will see who's still awake. And if you're still awake, I promise to put you to sleep. <laughs> All right, everyone's still with me? How, uh, we go another 35 minutes or so, 40 minutes, and then questions? Yeah, fine. All right, great, awesome. Change it up a lot, I'm gonna stand over here. Okay, uh, hi. <laughs> Sky, can I have a slide? Yes. So, uh, my name is Monty Kroll, and I'm one of the lead software engineers on World of Warcraft. I actually sound a little weird here. Can everyone hear me? I'm kind of naturally loud. Yeah. Yes. yeah. All right, yeah. let's do that. I'm going to do that. I, I, I'm going to turn that. I'm going to put on mute. I'm going to set it here. And hopefully no embarrassing noises are caught. So we're in here. All right, I'm kind of naturally loud. So I'm just going to talk to the room. Uh, can I have a slide? I'm going to teach you how games are programmed. So I'm the yeah. lead software engineer on World of Warcraft. So I have some questions for the room first. First of all, who is familiar with Blizzard games? Pretty much everyone in the room. OK, almost everyone. Who has, uh, so Adam asked who played or watched, who's played World of Warcraft? Who's still playing World of Warcraft? A few in the room, thank you, that's cool. I'm still playing World of Warcraft. I'm gonna ask you another odd question. Who here was born after October 23rd, 2000? Raise your hand if you're born after October 23rd, two, October 23rd, 2000, okay. October 23rd, 2000 is the day I started Blizzard. And I was working on World of Warcraft that day. So we were working on World of Warcraft way back in October of uh, 2000. I haven't been working on it continuously since then. I did some other projects, but I've been doing this for a long, long time, coming up on 18 years. All right, so who exactly am I? Um, uh, can I have one more? I've been a game developer since 1998. Before Blizzard, I worked for a teeny tiny company back in Chicago, and we worked on arcade games. Very small industry, and uh, quick that. October of 2000, I started Blizzard because I played, who here has played Diablo? Okay, Diablo is the reason I work at Blizzard. It was the first Blizzard game I saw when I played it, just knocked me on my butt. Um, it was incredible. I bought StarCraft on the strength of Diablo, fell in love with that, and while I was playing all these games, I was doing other programming. Who in the room is a computer programmer? So we got a bunch here, okay. Who in the room is a computer video game programmer? Right. You guys should give the talk. You already know this. We got a bunch of people in the room. Yeah, there's someone over here. That's good. Um, I studied computer engineering at University of Illinois, way back in the Midwest, and I was working in healthcare software, which actually uh, was pretty cool. And our company got sold right after I left for a hojillion dollars that I didn't get. Such a life. And. Uh, I really wanted to get into games though, and I got into games because of Diablo and StarCraft, and I was working on some other games at the time. I also played Half-Life, a bunch of other things. I almost, oh, I don't want to talk about Doom. Doom came out while I was in college. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that, that's going a while. It took, took a lot of restraint to, to not fail out on that. Um, I, uh, can I have one more slide? Thanks. All right. So uh, a bunch of the room, you're already computer programmers. You kind of know what programming is. Who does not have an idea what programming is? Out of curiosity, is anyone? Okay, you kind of don't really know what it is. OK. Um, quick one. Well, it's making programs. That's a dumb answer. Quick one more. <laughs> um, it's kind of weird in games, because it's not really obvious. Like, what part of a game is the program? So I get asked a lot, oh, you work in games? What do you do? Oh, I'm a, I'm a programmer. So people kind of stop, and they get this kind of squinty look, and they go, so do you like? <laughs> put the pictures in the game? I'm like, no, not exactly. They're like, do you make the guys move? And I'm like, sort of, not exactly. And my particular job is so squirrely to explain that I usually tell people I sort the recycling. It's much easier to sell that as a job than what I actually do. So uh, you know, the computer, the programs you see are the ones that run on your computer. That's the game that we patch down to you. We also have the programs that we run on our servers, and we have other stuff that we run that helps everything out. I actually run a team that runs everything else out. You rarely actually see my code outside of the buildings at Blizzard. I lead a tools team. And everyone goes, that's cool. Do you build like wrenches and stuff? No. <laughs> tools means programs for us. And uh, we build custom programs that we give to the designers that the designers use to build World of Warcraft. They go, cool. Does that like make the guys move and stuff? <laughs> Come back to that. And I say not exactly. What we actually do is we build um, a custom editor program. So if you played World of Warcraft, you know we have items and quests and zones and lighting and spells and all this other stuff. We build a development tool. I have a team of nine engineers, and we build a development tool that allows the designers to build that. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. Okay. So uh, what kind of programs are there? Will you give me one? 
Oh, wow, that totally washed out on this screen. That's awesome. That top thing says all programmers. It's the giant white circle. The next one down is a smaller circle that's game programmers, and the smaller circle yet is WoW programmers. Out of curiosity, I'm going to ask uh, two questions. Uh, let, me, let me ask this. How many developers do you think are on the World of Warcraft team? Just shout out some numbers. Go ahead. Uh, 200. 200? Okay, so I'm, I'm talking all devs. Programmers, artists, engineers. So your guess is 200. Anyone? What do you think? How many? 50? So I got 200, I got 50. How many? 80. Million. 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 Holy million. million. <laughs> <laughs> Could you imagine the light of the cafeteria if there were a million? <laughs> 2,000. 2,000? Okay. Uh, 200 is actually pretty close. We have, today we have about 300 developers on World of Warcraft. When we shipped World of Warcraft, we were actually closer to 50. Uh, there's nowhere near a million. Sorry about that. Uh, in Irvine, we have about 2,000 employees uh, across a lot of dev teams and a lot of other supporting teams. Um, so there's about 300 of us, which include uh, designers, artists who we don't have here tonight, producers and engineers, and a few other oddball, I don't want to say oddball, but sort of non-traditional roles, all lumped together. There's about 300 of us that make World of Warcraft. And we're actually much larger today than when we first shipped the game, because the game has gotten much, much larger, much more complicated to build, hopefully we think much more fun to play, which is why people are still playing it a lot of years later. Uh, on the WoW team, uh, of those 300, there's about 75 programmers. And my list over here shows uh, our programs are split up into a bunch of sub-teams. My team is this little block right here. But we've got a bunch of other people on there. I'm going to talk a little bit more about what we do, because I think that'll help give you some idea about uh, how games are made. I want to ask you a question. What was the smallest game dev team you ever heard of? One. One. <laughs> OK. What did that one person do? Everything. Everything. So, Going back to the first video games that the world saw, the, the first one, I think the first recorded one was in the late, late 1950s, but the first commercial one that ever got sold was a game called Pong. Who's heard of Pong? Okay. So um, before Pong, some, uh, the stuff that came, Pong came out in the, I want to say, early 70s, and between the late 50s and the early 70s, some experiments were made in there, and the first video games were actually implemented on oscilloscopes. And some guys figured out how to make oscilloscopes instead of tracing an electron beam, trace something interesting like a ball chasing around, or, or they did a, a lunar lander type game. That's the earliest stuff. And that stuff was all done only by uh, programmers. And the reason is, only programmers knew how to make the oscilloscope do something. And in fact, they weren't even really programmers then. That wasn't really a thing exactly. Computers were still very hardware oriented, so it wasn't a specialty where you just wrote software. Someone who could access the hardware and understood how it worked could reprogram it to do something else. So really, all the first games were built primarily by game programmers who really became the first game designers, and they kind of did everything because they were the only ones who could do anything. As the industry grew up, um, we started to involve other people because it turned out that we could make, the make programs on the computers to allow other people to express their ideas, and eventually we needed so many people, we needed producers to corral the whole works forward so we could get projects out the door. So there's about 75 programmers on WoW. I lead about... Uh, Nine of them work for me, so we're a team of 10. Can I have another slide? OK, so I pulled out, uh, I googled dirty programmer, right? So this is, a, <laughs> this is a common image. This is a people think for the programmer. This is an old image. The guy's got a smoke down there. No one would smoke on the computer, right? Uh, my first computer looked really, really similar to that. So uh, I can actually remember, and I think I had that exact model of printer. So th this, this goes back a ways. And of course, this goes back to the days when it was maybe one person would make the game, Put it on, uh, Adam said CD-ROMs. I go back to five and a quarter inch floppy disks. That were in, so older than that. Uh, but that's literally what it was. The game was on there. You would, uh, we call it, kind of called that fire and forget. Someone would make a game, they would test it, it would work. It was made for one system. Out it would go, you hope for the best. All right. Um, this is what we think we do. Today, we <laughs> we're much cooler now. Can we give it one more slide? Okay, and uh, this isn't going to read here, but I decided, how do we describe what we actually do? And I, uh, at Blizzard, we have a set of core values that kind of shape how we, how we uh, operate our business. One of our core values that we believe in very, very deeply is gameplay first. So it's, uh, we have a statue in our courtyard. Has anyone been to our campus? Has anyone seen it? A few people? So we have a big orc riding a wolf in the big statue in the center of our campus. And around it, there's a, a compass rose, and on the eight compass points are our eight core values. 
And we think those are the eight things that we think are our secret sauce, uh, things that we adhere to. And every practice, every activity we do, we tie back to one of our core values. Gameplay first is one of our core values. So as much as we want to say cool programming or awesome art or you know wicked technology, it's got to be fun. Adam touched on that in what he said. So it's got to come back to gameplay. So with that, I put the game designer on the throne. So Sky, uh, you'll, you'll assume this position here. <laughs> Secondary to that, I put the artists. And uh, kneeling before them is the programmer who's been charged to go forth and make the uh, designers and the artists' uh, uh, vision real. That's a lot of what we do. I put the producers standing guard there because they'll have my head if we don't do it right. <laughs> so this is, this is maybe a, a look at our process. I have a slide. OK. Um, I just grabbed some random code, which turns out to be completely unreadable at this resolution. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, but I said, you know, what do we do? We write in code over here, if you can actually read this. It's readable on the screen. This is a little bit of C++. I'm sure it's going to come up in the questions. But everyone asks, what, pro what are you programming? Go ahead and ask me that. We can talk about it at the end. And we take our code, and we turn it into stuff that the machine understands, which is actually shown on the right. Will you give me a slide? Can you give me one more? And we'll move. And then, of course, just that simple bit of code turns into uh, RAID first. I actually Googled uh, method RAID first, and I came up with some Russian screens here. So someone's <laughs> congratulated in Russian. Good Russian over there. OK. Yeah, it's really good. It's, really, it's, high, it's very high-level language. It's very expressive. <laughs> we advance a slide there. So uh, then I came back to what we actually do, and uh, there we go. So the, uh, the designer's happy, the artist is happy, the producer says we're on time. The other producer wants to know what's next, and the programmer has an ulcer. So that's, that's kind of the process. It seems, seems to work out OK. Can you be on the slide? All right. And like anything else, engineers are very dedicated to the task. And we know that it's right, just about to come to an end. One more quick. Yeah, we're almost done, right? So nothing else to do once that rock hits the top of the hill. Everyone knows how that story ends. Yeah. All right, one more. So um, here's some of the things. Uh, this is what I actually want to talk uh, a little bit about when we say how it's made. Uh, on a big team, in a big game, we actually become very, very specialized. We have a lot of different sort of specialized roles on the team. And these are things maybe you've had some, some touch points with or maybe you're interested in learning about. But it turns out those one-person games tended to be very simple, and they didn't express a lot of these. If you look at the old computers, they were very, very limited compared to today's computers. They could be programmed by one person. They had very simple graphics that could be produced by one person. And usually the challenge was trying to just make it all run in a tiny amount of RAM and you know, there wasn't really sound cards. Maybe you could make some beeps. Um, there wasn't really graphics. In a lot of cases, the very early stuff didn't even have color. So if you can just, a lot of um, early, early computer graphics experiments, uh, people would actually draw out what they wanted their pictures to be on graph paper. Because it would just be like, like a graph of pixels. It's going to be on or off, on or off. And then you can literally convert that into binary and drop it into your code. I did that when I was a kid. <laughs> so some of, the, uh, some of the things that we actually do today, we work on computer graphics. I'm assuming everyone in the room is pretty familiar with that. We all know what the pictures look like. Networking is how we make the computers talk to each other. That's usually done by our server team. Um, physics is done, uh, usually the people who do graphics are also uh, the same group that usually programs game physics. Game physics can mean a lot of things. When you shoot a guy, does the guy react? Does he blow back? When an explosion happens, do we toss people in the air? How many, who's played a game where you like shoot a guy and he like crumples to the floor? Everyone's done that? Okay, who's done that like crumbles to the floor and like a leg sticks out in a funny direction? <laughs> <laughs> or, or like you hit the guy and he shoots off to Jupiter? By <laughs> okay, those are physics errors. Physics actually turns out, to be, it turns out to be really, really hard to simulate. Even stuff like walking turns out to be super hard to simulate. And computers get faster and programmers try to take better swings at it, but, it, but it's still something that needs, needs a lot of work on it. Audio uh, is an easy one. Audio is so immersive, it's almost easy to forget that it's there, right? We have such good sound and such good music. It, it, it surrounds us with it, and you sometimes even forget that it's there, but it actually takes quite a lot of programming. And audio has had this kind of big convergence with Hollywood, too. It turns out that modern audio programming takes a lot of cues and techniques from uh, movie production, and kind of getting that into the game to feel seamless turns out to be its own programming specialty. That actually happens in graphics, too. Um, Who's played uh, Order 1886? Any of you guys play that? It's done by Ready at Dawn. <clears throat> so they're a PS4 developer. So a bunch of the guys who started that company, I worked with them way back when, they were ex-Blizzard folks. They actually did something cool. For their graphics, they actually implemented their graphics system so that they could exactly replicate the look of a bunch of Hollywood cinematic cameras. 
so that when they were building their scenes in game, they would actually specify, or we're gonna shoot this in game with like a Panaflex, whatever the numbers are, and so on. But they actually spent a bunch of work to, so they, they were taking a lot of clues and cues from Hollywood, and then when they hired designers, they actually looked for designers who had Hollywood framing experience because they would know exactly how to set up a shot. I thought that was a neat, kind of a neat look behind the curtain from them. Uh, people have to deal with uh, inputs. Keyboards, mice, that's pretty standard stuff. Uh, Logitech keeps sending us squirrely keyboards with displays on them. They would love it if the displays say things. We tell them, nope, sorry. <laughs> Most of the time, sometimes you tell them yes. Sometimes people have weird mice or other weird controllers. Um, people on their own time have screwed around with like VR looks through the world and some, some other stuff, but this is a programming specialty. <sighs> we have this oddball one called gameplay. I'm gonna skip that for a second and come back. Who knows what localization is? Anyone? A couple people in the room. Localization is the process by which we prepare games to go into other markets other than English. So another one of Blizzard's core values is think globally. Um, we have uh, a huge audience outside of North America. When we started, our games were popular in the US, but it turns out StarCraft blew up huge in the Korean market. And it's actually, we went to uh, the Olympic Stadium in South Korea in May of 2007, and that's where we announced StarCraft II to an audience of about 15,000 people. Uh, it was a massive, massive deal. Localization is how we uh, accommodate the uh, ability to s display the game and all the things that we change about it for other places other than where we built it, here, a little south of here, in Irvine. So it's why you can see uh, Korean text, it's why uh, you can type in Chinese in the Chinese version. We change audio around, we have to change graphics in some cases. A lot of, um, there's, there's a, an entire programming art to that because we also have to support different operating systems like Chinese Windows, for instance, has some subtle differences in how we get keyboard input and things. Uh, if you've played our games, you've played them recently on the Battle.net app, and we have an entire department that programs that, and that's something they're not even game devs, but they are really responsible for getting our stuff onto your hard drive or your SSD so you can play. It's super important. If they don't cover that step, you don't get to play our stuff. Looks awesome in the office, right? Those play tests that I haven't talked about are fantastic. No one else gets to see it. We gotta get it out to you. <laughs> we deal with security. Um, security has a lot of faces on it. The stuff that probably most closely touches you is cheating, right? Cheat detection. We don't want people to cheat in our games. That takes programmers. Um, usually it's programmers who are making the cheats and it's programmers who are defeating the cheats and there's a bit of an arms race that happens in there. Uh, what I call metrics is we measure as much stuff as we can. Um, the Overwatch team has tons of metrics, right? They want to know, is Symmetra actually trash or not? Not really. He has a 50% winner rate. And he knows that because we put metrics in the game and we can record everything that happened in a game and we can record all the outcomes and we can uh, warehouse this massive set of data and then be able to ask questions about it. And that's all done by programmers um, and actually data scientists and there's a whole kind of subspecialty there if we're able to record that data and then dig it out later. And uh, tools and support, which is what my team does. We build programs, we give to artists and designers. So I work with a team of programmers who are famously cave trolls, like the nerdy guy. As much as we want to be Iron Man, I think we're a little more 70s guy. And uh, we deal with a, a vast, vast array of uh, technical prowess in the game designers. So game designers can be extremely technical designers who are maybe, maybe we're computer programmers and decide to get design like Adam said, um, he did, he started in programming, said, not my jam, but who's trained as a programmer, and then goes into game design. We deal with them, and we also deal, um, one group we deal with are basically creative writers. And they're still designers, they're doing narrative design, what we do, but we deal with everything in that spectrum, and so we have to have a special skill set where we're programmers with a very soft white glove touch, depending on who our, who our users are. And there's this weird thing that we call gameplay. And gameplay is a little bit of everything else. This is the one where I think where people narrow their eyes and ask me that, what do you do question? I think the thing that most people are thinking of is what we call gameplay. And gameplay I like to describe is the designers make the rules for the game. We have to teach a computer how to enforce those rules and how to let you play according to those rules. And I think that's what gameplay is. The, the best description of that is probably along that way. When the designer says, you know what, I think Tracer needs this blink ability, the engineer is, oh my gosh, they're gonna change the position instantly and the physics is gonna freak out and uh, we're gonna have to record that and so on. But that's ultimately what gameplay programmers do. They take and I think gameplay programmers really make the vision of the designers real. 
Well, all of this stuff, I think, is part of it. The gameplay is probably closest to the design process. Email more slide? I think that's my last slide. Yes. Okay. So that was kind of a, an overview of all the things that we do. So we say, how, is ga how are games made? We're all doing this stuff all at the same time. Um, and we support different parts of uh, the game process at different times. So at the highest level, really the stuff that happens is design and story, right? For, for Blizzard, uh, for every time we do a World of Warcraft expansion, there's a high level narrative story that's a big narrative beat that's told. For instance, Burning Crusade was Illidan's gonna rise up, the big evil, the players have to fight their way to Illidan, defeat him at the Black Temple. That's sort of the big narrative beat for it. For Lorath the Lich King, of course, was Arthas uh, coming back and summoning the, uh, the undead army and we have to stop Arthas. So, um, once there's a big idea for the story like that, that gets taken and divided into smaller sort of chapters, you can think of it. And, they, and it gets divided, divided, divided into smaller pieces until it winds up being individual things that you do in the game. It's going to turn into quests. It's going to turn into scenarios. And that's where it starts to have touch points with us. Once we decide what the world is going to look like, then uh, my team has given tools to the level designers who start to go in and terraform the world. And they paint on it. And then they pass it downstream to quest designers who use our tools again, more programs, and they uh, start to add spawns to it. They start to add creatures. And they start to add uh, loot. And everyone. Uh, then using our tools, they generate data, and then the gameplay programmers implement the systems that take that data and run it in the game, and then we do, again what Adam said, we play test it. And we do it again, and we do it again, and we do it again, and we do it again. And we are our first customers. Um, we build things that we love to play, and you don't see most of our mistakes because we play them early and we try them, and we say, ooh, yeah, we, we really missed on that one, missed the mark. Let's go back and try it again, let's go back and try it again, let's go back and try it again. And hopefully by the time we put it in front of you, it's had a lot of that. And all of these programming specialties are all supporting the game dev process as we go, all in service of that mission, gameplay first, so we can find the fun in it. Another one of our core values is commit to quality, which is part of why we iterate. We do these things, we do them early, we do them often, we probably do them harder than some other devs. Um, I don't want it's part of why Blizzard has uh, famously long schedules. The Blizzard soon, when it's ready, we're kind of famous for that. And that's part of our commit to quality. And it's hard, right? There's a lot of hard problems and it takes a long time to solve them. And we commit to taking that time to find the fun to make it the best game that we can. Um, that's kind of an overview. It's not a super deep dive on it, but I know you guys will have a bunch of questions in the q and I'll answer them the best that I can. Been doing it a long time. Be happy to talk to you about it. With that, I want to bring on Sky. Talk about right. the design process. So I think we're back to people that like dark. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll, we'll turn it up. Everyone can go back to sleep now. If you're yawning, it's fine. It's be fine. That's plenty dark. That's very dark. That, that works though. We'll make it work. <laughs> OK, so. I've been at Blizzard for about 10 years. Prior to going to Blizzard, uh, I worked in television and film production. Uh, I was a camera assistant. I worked on a lot of stunt films, blowing stuff up. Um, did uh, production, writing, um, direction, stuff like that. Uh, when I moved to Blizzard, um, uh, like Monty, I love their games. I, I was like, I, w I want a home, and I want to be involved in the company that I care about. Um, so uh, I, I, I brought my film resume to Blizzard, and they're like, I don't know what this means. <laughs> I was like, it means I can do a lot of stuff. And they're like, yeah, but I don't think that applies. And I was like, okay, what you got? And they're like, QA. And I'm like, okay. So <laughs> I actually went in and um, started in QA, which is quality assurance, testing the game, um, and was in there for about a year. But I was pretty determined to start making stuff. Um, from there, I went into creative development um, and helped all the teams uh, doing media capture and stuff like that. And then um, from there, I moved on to become a producer for Diablo 3 and then Overwatch um, before I realized that kind of one of my favorite things about film was the immersion that you had. Like, you really felt like you were a hero and or on that adventure. And uh, with games, I could give that and let you be in it. 
So um, that's kind of what pushed me towards design. And I've been on the wild team for a little over a year now. Um, but uh, so like many other roles in game development, uh, people say, what do you do? And it's like, well, stuff. Take up the recycling. <laughs> yeah. Uh, train lemurs. IT, we're, yeah, we're <laughs> mostly good at it. Yeah, there you go. So uh, basically, uh, designers create content for the game, or a specific type of content, because everybody is making something for the game. Um, this is sort of an odd image to represent us, but uh, it kind of covers what a designer is. We're a jack of all trades, wear all the hats, because you never know what they're going to ask you to work on next. Um, we bring all the elements that everybody else creates together, so visual effects artists, animators, <coughs> uh, modelers, like we put all those things together and try and do their work justice. And um, basically it's our work to, our, it's our job to make sure everyone else's work has a chance to shine. Um, and all of this is ultimately to being played first, bring a great player experience to, to our fans. Um, Part of the content creation, while this isn't designed specifically, it all kind of works together. Um, Arnold Sang was the assistant, is the assistant art director for Overwatch. Uh, he started putting together these flavor pieces for our heroes, kind of to get a vibe of who they are, what they are, what they do, stuff like that. Um, from there, there, they started making comics, 2.5Ds, cinematics, stuff like that. And uh, when we started working on the Junkertown map, um, we wanted to bring some of that into the game. So somebody put together the Dastardly Duo's uh, primitive land mount, which if you've played Overwatch, nothing has wheels in Overwatch, everything covers. So that makes this like definitely an antique in the game. And now uh, that's where it actually lives in Junker Town and players can interact with it any time. Um, and another big part of us, as everyone's mentioned, is finding the fun. So um, for every facet of the game, it takes a lot of play tests to make sure everything feels just right. Um, as Adam mentioned, uh, you, you have to keep tasting your dinner. Um, does the player feel powerful? Is it fun for every hero, class, build? If it doesn't, change it. Um, having to throw an idea away isn't a failure. It's just a successful test of what didn't work. Um, ultimately, we learn and grow and make it better, which is another one of our core values. Um, so this was a Junker, uh, Junkertown gray box map. And from there, we played it and played it until we got to the final. Um, it takes a lot of play tests to get from point A to point B. Uh, in this video, you'll see kind of uh, the evolution of the map. So you'll notice um, the blockers, which are like walls and, and ramps and things like that, they'll start changing as they played it more and more, where are the eye lines, where are the sight lines, where can you blow someone up too easily, um, what makes it more even for uh, attackers and defenders, um, and as, as they start trying to find the fun, then we start artifying it, um, start putting in graphics, start playing with the light, you'll see it get like warmer and cooler temperature wise, it sets the mood and the vibe for the map. And at the bottom, I don't know if you can see it, but it kind of shows through the dates of the evolution. And even the smallest things like where the payload stops and where the turns are, what type of menu board is on the diner, uh, that stuff gets uh, tuned <coughs> until it's just exactly right. Uh, if you notice at the bottom, it says takeout. Uh, we have an Australian um, tools, uh, tools lead on Overwatch who uh, corrected us to make sure that we made it say takeaway, not takeout. Um, on Diablo 3, one of the, the, the things that were coming up was uh, the Barbarian didn't feel strong enough. Has everybody played Diablo 3? Yeah. Uh, how do you feel, think the Barb feels? Good? Strong? It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's not symmetric. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the thing that came up over and over again was I just don't feel strong enough. I don't feel like I'm destroying everything in front of me. 
they tuned the numbers, they tuned the damage output, the types of monsters they were going against, the effects that they were playing. None of that was really giving anybody the feeling of, yeah, I'm a super powerful barbarian. Um, with a lot of back and forth between art, engineering, and design, they decided to try one more thing, which Monty mentioned earlier. They decided to uh, tune the physics. So if you watch these guys when they get hit, <laughs> now he felt overpowered. Now he was strong enough. And it didn't change anything about damage output or what happened. It was how much impact you had on the thing that you were hitting is what made people feel like they were finally hitting hard. One of our other uh, facets of design is show, don't tell. Um, they also, uh, some people refer to it as play, don't tell. You don't have a lot of time in the game to really elaborate on every new thing we introduce to you. So we try to put as much flavor in the game as we can without actually telling you what it is. Um, the Tortolans, uh, Zach Owens is a designer on World of Warcraft and he had this idea for turtle people. He wanted turtle people, he talked to a concept artist, he said, man, draw me a turtle person. <laughs> kind of looks like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. But um, uh, then it started trying to figure out who are the turtle people. The Tortolans are their name. And uh, they're historians, librarians, discoverers, explorers. Uh, they aren't into fighting. They, they don't really care about all the drama that's going on in the world. They're very long-lived and very patient. So, uh, uh, level design started placing items like the, the, the scrolls in the middle there. Um, character art put scrolls on the gear and stuff like that. Um, even as much as um, traditional taxi points in World of Warcraft are usually a flyer and a person. You talk to the person, you hop on the flyer. So for the Totolans we decided to do something different and make a scroll of flight. Uh, it hovers in the air when you interact with it. It turns you into a ball of water and you fly on to the next location. Um, also in this POI, uh, Adel Grawl and Zoldazar, um, one of the things that they ask you to do is instead of fighting things to get them what they want, uh, they're going to be here a really long time. Just go ahead and hide it for us and we'll come back and get it in a few hundred years. And then this is just a quick example of kind of how they have you do that. Hey, it's a cow. <laughs> <laughs> this type of flavor kind of like gives you an idea of who they are and what they're doing without actually spelling everything out for you. <coughs> and sometimes really it's just little things that bring a smile to your face that's kind of what the design is all about. <laughs> So um, ultimately, like making a game is, it's a collaborative effort. <laughs> collaborative effort. Uh, all the different teams talk to each other constantly and we're uh, always in communication. Um, it goes across multiple disciplines within in a team. It goes between multiple departments within the company and it goes through multiple regions around the world just to make sure that everybody has a, a really epic gaming experience. Um, it's challenging. Uh, well, game people work very long hours and we end up doing a lot of stuff over and over again to get it just right. Um, creatively, artistically, technically, logistically. Um, <laughs> but at the end of the day, it's really worth it. Um, we all love to see the reaction of the fans, especially when they love what we love making. So I think we're all loud enough that you guys can hear us without the microphones, right? Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. Let's forego that. So we'll move towards the middle and have a seat, and then um, easiest way to do this: um, <coughs> small group. Yeah, we can go by hands. <coughs> that works for you. <coughs> that's fine, yeah, you can pass the microphone around. <coughs> Pardon me, jeez. That's what happens when you talk a lot. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
So this group here has a ton of experience. Um, we can answer any question you have. <coughs> I can actually talk for artists. As I said, I was an artist for nine, 10 years, I actually ended as an art director. Um, generationally, I'm about eight years out of date, so don't ask me about normal maps. But I can help out with art questions as well. So fire it away. Raise your hand if you have questions. <coughs> so this guy. Yep. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so my question is more about the um, the coding aspect. Um, the I want I have the questions since I'm interested on in doing this um, of like what programs you would recommend <coughs> and like what the specs of a computer you would um, recommend for programming games? So, um, so if you're just getting started and you don't know what to do it, there's a couple great choices, right? The one we kind of recommend everyone who's, I give this talk a lot, Unity, right? Unity, you can download for free get started. Are you, have you, are you messing around with it yet? Uh, no, but I've looked into it. All right, that's a great place to start. Um, specs of the computer are a little bit less important to us. It turns out that in service of gameplay first, we actually tune our games to run on kind of crappy computers. And it depends on the game, right? Overwatch is a very action-oriented, uh, high frame rate game where uh, speed is important and it has higher system specs than World of Warcraft, which we want to run on everyone's computer, right? And we found lots of people play on their laptops and people don't upgrade laptops very often. So I don't think it's super important if you can run the Unity ID, you can probably get started. Um, I would definitely recommend it. I mess around with Unity. It's a great way to prototype. Uh, there's a producer on another project. Um, he's not really an engineer by training, but uh, there was a, a, a section <coughs> of the game, a, a store experience that he, no one was doing and he needed to do it. So he's like, you know, I'll just do it myself. And he sat down and kind of figured it out and did an interactive uh, store map for something that he, he was experimenting with. I would definitely recommend getting started there. It's, it's pretty gentle learning curve. There's tons of videos and things. All right, thank you. Uh, Another good place to start, by the way, um, is also like Unreal is another great engine. And it they is. Have, they have their own programming yep. language, which is a scripting language, yep. which in a lot of ways can be a lot easier to start. And one of the great things about something like Unreal is they've done a lot of things. So you're like, hey, I want to make a gun that shoots something. Mm -hmm. You can look at what they did and yep. kind of just modify it a little bit. You want to use the same business, too. Yep. Yep. Um, I'll also pitch our own stuff. If you want to dip a gentler toe in it, um, there's programmers I know who work on WoW now who got started uh, making a modification for World of Warcraft, which is just, you just need a text editor, you start by editing Lua, and the, the game itself is your scripting engine, or um, your, your program interpreter to try to learn that. And there's other people who got their start uh, making uh, trigger maps for, uh, used to be Warcraft 3, now it's Starcraft 2, but you, we actually have a really full featured editor in those games. And uh, it's a great way to kind of get introduced to some of the concepts, how the pieces fit together before you actually try coding it from scratch. So drink a little bit of our own Kool-Aid. Yeah. <laughs> I think I saw a tuxedo guy back there. Uh, uh, thank you. Hello. Uh, what skills do you value most in the people you work with? These can be social or soft or hard skills. Uh, that's a great question. You want to swing at it first? I'll uh, OK, on. as a producer, I have to work with the most people. Yeah. Um, Key thing is don't be a jerk. <laughs> I'm, I'm serious, right? Like we're all super creative. Yep. We're all really passionate about what we do. We all care a lot. And sometimes when you care a lot, you voice that opinion, right? And it's important that every voice, um, let's talk about another core value. Every voice matters, that's right? So that's, that's another one that's around the orc. And what that actually comes down to is don't be a jerk, right? Your opinion is just as valid as my opinion. You may have different opinions, but in the end of the day, we're all here to make a great game. So the very first thing, the, the best thing you can do as a game developer, well, A, love games, but B, don't be a jerk. You gotta work with other people. You gotta get along with them. They have opinions, they have passions. They're no different than you are. They just see something from a different perspective. What else? Sky? Um, we should all answer that one. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna, we should all answer it. His, is, his, his covers a lot of, of issues that come up, but um, problem solving. Problem solving is something that uh, being good at doing is very valuable. Um, being proactive, um, being able to, you know, jump in and go, yeah, let me help, chief, you know, like that, that really matters when you're, when you're making a game because you're gonna, like, I'm gonna have to run over there and be like, dude, I need this thing real quick because this other thing over here isn't gonna work unless, 
and then once that gets sorted out, you know, like being able to interact and, and make things happen is, is really beneficial, especially when you're going into a long work week. Uh, problem solving is huge. Don't be a, a jerk is huge. Um, out of curiosity, uh, do you have a specific interest, programming or design? Uh, I'm more interested in like what, what you think. I, I've dabbled in a lot of okay. different so there's a so I'm a hiring manager for engineers. I hire other engineers, um, and there's a few things that we look for in the interview process. Uh, and for me, um, of course, I mentioned for what we do, we work with a lot of uh, non-technical users. So I specifically look for engineers who don't need to be upfront, um, like show off what they did to the world. We're the long lever behind Wow. Uh, we often talk about ourselves as a force multiplier when we give the designers really good tools. They build really creative things like tortolans. Um, it's fun. And she, uh, the other thing they like is they like really old things. So, uh, they're like sort of antiquers. So it's kind of cool when they have vendors and they sell this ancient junk. It's kind of neat. Um, but when we give the designers powerful tools, they build great things. So I look for people who are interested in that role. Uh, the other thing I look for, just as a sort of a programming specialty, is I look for people who can debug. Um, we write the bugs, and we have to go find the bugs, right? There's an old yarn that says uh, writing the code should be called end bugging the code, because what you do after is debug it. Uh, but uh, I actually look for programmers who have a really good debugging bent. Programmers who are willing to, you know, I'm not sure what's going on, let me get on the debugger, take an educated guess about what's happening, dig in, and try to look for the bug there. And programmers who won't do that, I typically won't hire. I want to add one thing to problem solving too. I love when I talk to anyone in any discipline, sometimes we get snagged on something. And part of problem solving is to make your best guess and go on. And I love people who can do that. Um, that that's important to me on my team when people say, well, I'm not, I'm not sure 100%, but I'm gonna guess it this way and let's proceed from that guess and see how, how this unfolds. And um, there's another thing they sometimes say in uh, um, fail fast, is a, another thing we say, which fail is fail fast, fail often. Yeah, fail fast, fail <laughs> often, which means uh, uh, I forget which one of you said it, but it, it's I, I think Sky, you said it. It's an idea. It's not a failure. It's a, a test of an idea that we know isn't isn't the right direction. Um, it's good to be able to get to those things quickly and not have this sort of like you know hand wringing. Oh, I don't know what to do, kind of thing. But make a decision, move on with it, and um, try to. Uh, use that to inform the next decision, make a better decision the next time. So I, I kind of look for that. It's kind of hard to hunt that out in interviews, but you know, that's one of the things we look for. Um, so for the artists in the room, because we covered you know, general game plan and everything else and engineering, um, for the artists, um, what do we look for? It's all in your portfolio. And that's, that doesn't mean that you're an amazing draw, uh, amazing drawer. Great I, draw good. I draw good. <laughs> we don't work for English <laughs> skills or public speaking skills, <laughs> FYI. And producers are supposed to be good at that. But you're, that you're creative, right? That you have creativity, creativity. Jeez, I'm horrible today. You have a vision. It's low blood sugar. Yeah, it's low blood sugar. You have a vision and you can kind of get that out on paper, right? So um, when you are an artist trying to get onto a game team, don't come to us and go, I want to work on World of Warcraft. Let me tell you about my skeletons and demons. <laughs> <laughs> no, you should go to Diablo for that, right? You obviously have a passion for it. You have a creativity for it. There are some skeletons and demons, maybe a little bit lighter <coughs> versus, say, Macabre. Um, you know, if you want to work on Overwatch, you're like, hey, this is my, uh, this is my portfolio of knights in shining armor or superhero game. <laughs> um, it doesn't mean that you can't do those things, but it does mean that you want to find a good match, and I think that's true for any of the teams. We want to find people that are passionate about what we do. So, like, as an artist, make sure you're designing either a portfolio that's very broad, mm -hmm. or when you're applying for a job, you target, right? And you show us the work that we want to see. You may have drawn everything under the sky, you may be a model or an animator, you're an artist savant, but if you're interviewing or you want to join a team as a concept artist, show us your drawings. If you want to join uh, a team that's making Diablo, show us your dark side. Um, if you want to join Hearthstone, show us your light side, right? Show us you have a sense of humor. Um, it's really important, uh, once again, when you're looking for teammates, you're looking for teammates with similar interests, and you're looking for teammates that want to make the same thing that you make. We just highlighted this recently. There's something like 20 artists inside of Blizzard right now, and full-time employees, who came in through the fan art program. 
<laughs> which means they brought in stuff, they, they knew the style, they draw things they liked from the games they liked, they sent it in, and eventually that turned into, into jobs. Four of our artists were students for some, one of our guys that uh, helped teach classes, you know? <laughs> you never know where you're going to start. Also play the games. Play, play the games. <laughs> play games. That's a good point. Oh my gosh. We yeah, assume yeah. they can play games. I, I get that. People but come in and they're like... Oh. You can't just assume that. Yeah. Well, no, people come in interviews and they haven't played and it's, it, it's hard. It's possible, but really a long shot. You got to be really, really good at something else if you don't know our game. <laughs> what about design? What's your what's your oh, question? It's next? the same thing. Um, like, what values, like, or what uh, skills would you value in a designer? All of the above. Okay. Um, it, it, designers really do have to, and and it depends what kind of designer. Um, and that's a thing that I probably could have elaborated a little bit better on fish picture. But I mean, we have narrative designers, combat designers, encounter designers, quest designers. Um, sound designers, level designers, like there, there's a different type and, and it depends on the company. Like uh, at one company they can say, I'm a designer and they just, they do level and quest and something else. Um, WoW's so big and has so much content that goes into it, they've broken everybody off into like subgroups. So like systems, rewards, items, everything is its, is its own um, design discipline. So, um, find out which one you like. Because math or narrative or, or visual, like these are all different things that uh, you're gonna bring to the table and, and focusing on the one you like is gonna get you to where you wanna be a lot quicker. You, you may not know, by the way, at first. I mean, I didn't. I was writing healthcare software, I thought it was awesome, before I thought, you know, maybe I could be a game programmer. Um, and there's so many kinds of designers, and they come, and actually, interestingly, so many of our designers came from like oddball backgrounds. Who, uh, Greg Street, anyone remember that name? Ghost Crawler it was real popular in World of Warcraft. Okay, uh, before he's a riot now, right? Yeah, yeah he's a riot now. Uh, I like Greg. He was one of my coffee buddies. We used to drink a lot of espresso until we were shaking. Um, before he got into game design, he was a marine biologist. Wow. <laughs> right. And there was a there, and Ian Hazakostas, who's our game director now. Before he got into game design, he was a lawyer. You know. Hard, it's hard to say, right? But people discover their passion, they discover what they're good at, but it's not, a lot of times not the first step. Um, really quick though, for designers, um, it's really important that you get used to making something. So mm -hmm. we talked earlier, Star StarCraft editor, Unreal editor, you know, uh, the Valve tool set, yep. uh, Unity, yep. you need to make something, right? You can't be like, I have a great idea for a game, let <laughs> me tell you, and then you drop a, a, a set of papers that's about yay high. I kid you not, like, I've worked on a lot of games, they're like, here's the design doc, <laughs> and you're like, you know. Yeah, um, the, the real trick is, like, uh, I, for example, hired a designer um, back when I worked at Electronic Arts, and he had never worked in games before, but the thing, and he went up against some experienced designers that had worked in games. He came in and said, hey guys, I made a marble game. And we said, you made a marble game? And he goes, yes, this is what I made. And he puts this box down. And the box has marbles. And he goes, okay, let me tell you the rules. And he told us the rules. And we played that game for about 30, 45 minutes. And we forgot to ask him questions because we were having fun. <laughs> right? And it was literally, it was like some weird combination of like Marble Madness and Chinese checkers. It was just fun, right? And like, he didn't have access to a computer. He just made a game, right? And really, the truth is, is guys like these make amazing tools. You just need to know what to do with it. And you need to show us that you can do that. So. Thank you. All right. Uh, there was, um, I had this guy in the blue shirt, then this guy, and then two more over here. Yeah. So Actually, maybe a good way to do it is, if you have a question, line up behind the camera there. <laughs> and then we'll just go down the line, otherwise yeah. we're going to forget. So we'll start with the, which guy did you pick? Uh, put him I, in had, the front. I had the guy with the blue collar shirt, this guy. Let's so right. put him at the front. All right, we'll put him in the front, um, and then we'll go from there. Real quickly, Ken, how much time do we have? We got another 15. We got 15 minutes, we got a bunch of people in line, so I guess yeah. we'll, we'll keep our answers a little more yeah, yeah, terse. tighter. And we might go a little longer too, so. That's fine. If you guys are willing to stay, in some cases we are too. Fine. What's, what's your question? Um, oh, wow. Uh, I guess that's, uh, this is more directed for you. Yeah. Uh, but um, like working on a game yep. like World of Warcraft is yep. so big. Yep. How, how do new hires like navigate like this system? 
because it's yeah. like you like you're a tool maker, so you like, can, you'll make new tools. Yeah. But as far as it's like basically a legacy system because it's been along for so long. Sounds like the adjustment period. Yeah, I mean it's a mix of uh, old stuff and new stuff. Um, designers actually have it harder. They say a designer takes about nine months to get proficient in building WoW because there's so many systems. It's it's so complicated in it. <coughs> it's my job as the hiring manager to try to onboard people. Um, so what we usually do is we usually find very, very small tasks that we can assign to someone. So we'll find small softball bugs or small tasks. We have a, it's a giant product. We're never done. We have thousands and thousands of things that kind of don't get looked at because we're vastly outnumbered by designers and everyone else on the team. I have about 10 engineers and we have about 200 customers for WoW Edit. Um, we're all very important uh, content creators, and that's like a 20 to one ratio um, of requests to what we can actually implement. So we have this big backlog, and we'll usually give people some softball things, and we'll sign them a dive buddy for the first time in. Um, so I'll pair up a, a new engineer with a more senior engineer who knows their way around. And it takes a few months, and uh, part of one of our core values, uh, Sky mentioned, is learn and grow. So that's part of what we do is we start small. Another thing, it's not a core value, but it's something we always say is crawl, walk, run. So um, when someone comes into us, it's very much in the crawl phase, right? We, they, we can hire extremely experienced engineers, but they don't know the World of Warcraft stuff. We call that domain experience. And we'll start off by teaching them with very small, easier things. <coughs> Excuse me, we're all dry from talking. I've had two summer engineers, uh, uh, summer interns, and uh, in both cases, we gave them projects that didn't actually change any designer data. There were things that designers wanted different ways of viewing existing data, and we thought that was very safe because it kind of takes away the responsibility. You're not actually going to break anything because you can't actually write any data. So that's another way we kind of keep them safe, kind of some training wheels to start. Cool, thank you. Thank you. <coughs> so, my question regards like game balance. Yep. When you guys are tweaking, patching, hitting something with the nerf bat, like yep. how much of that, what percentage of that is math, analysis, statistics, all of that, and how much of that is just what, what feels good? Well, <laughs> I can do some. I can do some of it. Go, Adam, I think all three of us can. Okay. Um, so uh, we had a guy on WoW that I used to call the WoW Actuary. Um, okay. and, uh, <laughs> that says a lot right there. He wasn't actually, but he spent a lot of time uh, balancing curves, running simulations. Uh -huh. um, we have uh, one of those specialties I put up on the board, automation. Um, they actually ran a test recently. They were running a thousand uh, boomkins, right? Druids in moonkin form. They were running a thousand boomkins and watching the stats for, they were actually running a performance test too, but they were also gathering stats. There's one guy who runs a hundred, um, he'll run a hundred of each class at a time and watch damage output, damage saturation, and various encounters. So we do automation. That's, that's very mechanical. That'll give you a number, like Adam said, you know, 50% wins. Great, we did it. Mm -hmm. It's more of a soft skill to get it, like we can do everything very mechanically and it's not fun, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? So I think that's more of a, a soft skill. Um, one of our other values, it's not a core value, but it's a value on our team is what we call concentrated coolness. So we'd rather have three unique feeling things than 10 things that aren't really differentiated well from each other. So that's really a design specialty. Not, not in my wheelhouse, we try to give them good tools to be able to do that. Got it. Yeah, and so, some of it too is um, perception versus reality. Mm -hmm. um, so, like dude, <laughs> yeah. the yeah. mm -hmm. um, uh, players, if they lose a lot, it's them, it's class, mm -hmm. everything is bad. Yeah. It's horrible. We're all gonna die. Um, and a lot of it is is just swinging the pendulum the right amount because you want everybody to feel like a super awesome hero, mm -hmm. like they're gonna save the day on their own. <laughs> and um, trying to find a good balance of they're not demolishing everybody else and they still feel like a superhero is like kind of where you're kind of swinging between always. Mm -hmm. um, there's a question that I ask new designers that come in, or even if I'm in the interview, which is, is fun balanced or is balanced fun? And um, it's really interesting to see what people's responses are, um, because if you were playing the game and you won 50% of the time, it's perfectly balanced, yeah. perfectly balanced. Is it fun for you? No, I lost half the time, I'm horrible. Um, yeah. So like a lot of, so as Guy said, it's, it's a perception. The, so the real trick there, and we have, there are actually two or three design disciplines. So like a systems designer, is that math guru? And they'll be like, T -t 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 here's the answer, right? Uh -huh. um, and they build the structure. But then you have kind of gameplay designers 
or narrative designers that go, okay, but you know what? Like from a from a balance perspective, you just need to add plus one. Like your damage is one. Is that exciting? No, 10. 10 is exciting, add a zero, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So then we change things. And so I think the real trick is you need to make everybody feel broken without actually being broken. So you just push the limits and you see what you can do um, and you just make in an interesting experience, right? There are certain things that need to be more balanced than others, but you always err on the side of, is somebody having fun? And hopefully them having fun doesn't mean somebody else is having a horrible experience. <laughs> so that's the other extreme. Yeah, cool. Sometimes you can lose if you're playing against somebody, like, but damn, that was close. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. and that felt good. Mm -hmm. But if they just steamroll your face every time, then you're kind of like, eh. Yeah. But if you really want to get into the game balance, uh, math is very important. Very, very important. <laughs> If you look across Blizzard games, one of our things that we have, there's always this rock, paper, lizard, but uh, with, you know, lizard, lizard, rock, paper, lizard. Yeah. Pa well, rock, paper, lizard. Rock, paper, lizard. Oh, thank you, that one. <laughs> <laughs> I should have just said rock, I should have just stuck to what I knew, right? Rock, rock paper, scissors. Um, but there's very much that asymmetric aspect, and I think that's a big key to uh, having it, you, you feel broken without actually being broken. All right, cool. cool. Hi. Hello. Hello. Uh, my question is more on the art side. I'm wondering, uh, considering what is taught in traditional art training, um, what, what are the gaps between what a student might come out of school knowing in terms of education and also experience? Um, what, what is missing to be able to work in the game? Uh, so you say traditional art like illustration art? There's lots of traditional arts. Like, give, give me an example. Like, yeah, what, uh, what, what, obviously you go to school illustration, right? Yeah. All right, so um, illustration. So the um, biggest thing for an illustrator, obviously traditional art training is really great. You learn anatomy, you learn composition, you learn color theory. Um, for those of you who are artists, you're like, yeah, that makes total sense, right? The short version is the guy doesn't look funny. Um, it doesn't look like he's in the wrong place and why is he green? Um, but the short version is you learn all those core skills and those are super important. But the real trick from moving from fine art to game development art comes back to that, um, get it done quick and move on, right? Um, the traditional failure of an artist or a traditional failure of fine art is they spend a lot of time just getting it right. It's like, look at my beautiful painting. And the reality for game development is we want people that can iterate quickly, that can get designs on paper. They may not be the best designs, they may not be the perfect designs, but they're in, they're good. They kind of have those core values of good composition, good anatomy, you know, good color theory, and we get out, get it out there really quick, really fast. Like you saw those tracer drawings, those were just really quick thumbnails. So the best thing I can say is, and a lot of, like when I was in art school, those guys really needled the heck out of it. Like you were sitting in a life drawing class, you're like, eyes just a little off to the right, right? And that's super important skill to have to know what things look like, but realize you can let that go and you can go much looser, and it's really about being collaborative. So especially for an illustrator, especially for a fine artist, it's great that you can make a painting. I wanna, I wanna see that you can sit with somebody like Sky and go, I kind of think it needs to look like this. They're like, well, that's great, give it horns. Horns? Nah, and you can kind of iterate quickly through it. So being flexible and being, um, not fast, but just flexible and, and kind of, don't treat it like your masterpiece, treat it like something that's gonna lead to a bigger masterpiece that everybody's involved. Okay. The one thing I'll add to that is um, one of the things that I did notice that came up with a lot of newer students was not knowing how a thing would be built. Mm -hmm. So so learning what a 3D artist does will also help you because, you know, why is that little flappy thing right there? Like the physics isn't going to work if somebody like tries to build that on a model or, or like little details like that or why is it there at all or how does this function? Sometimes we'll come up for a concept artist and that's a problem that they'll have to solve before somebody can actually build the thing. Wow, shoulder pads. Actually a big problem for a variety of reasons. Dude can't raise his arms. A whole bunch of things don't work really well. So well, your head's just a lot yeah. more. <coughs> Spike resistant? <laughs> shoulder pads have a technical reason behind it, but I'll tell yeah. you that after. Well, there's that <laughs> Thank you guys. No problem. You're welcome. Hi, how are you? Hello. So currently I'm a UCI student getting my master's in uh, business analytics, specialization, data analytics. So my question is gonna be a little more engineering based. So um, when you're hiring, mm -hmm. uh, is there something special that you look for in a candidate or is it just, are they gonna meet the requirements and are they just like something special or yeah, if you can answer that. Oh, for sure we look for, if we have a choice, of course we look for something special. We look for enthusiasm, we look for passion, we look for people of the games. 
the guy who walks in with a game, right, his story about a marble, I've, I've had that experience where someone walked in and plop, plopped down the game, like, it's not big, but it's done. That's a huge thing for me, by the way. If you ever are sitting across the table from me, if you've done a project, end to end, small project, I advise everyone, if you want to try doing this, do a project, pick something small. You're not going to go out and write, wow, wow, it takes 300 people today to keep the train. You're not going to do that. Um, but if you pick something small and say, here's a thing that I made, and it, to me, that tells me that you had to dot all the I's and cross all the T's. You had to figure out problems. You, if you're a programmer, you wrote the code, you certainly wrote bugs, and you had to debug it. You had to figure out how to get art in it. Either you made it, or you bought it, or you collaborated with someone, whatever it took. Maybe you put some sounds in, but you finished the thing, and it requires so many moving parts. That shows me a dedication. That's something I look for. I told you already, I look for debugging, someone who has an enthusiasm about that. I look for problem solvers, just like Sky does. I think that's super important. And if you put it all together and are a good communicator, I think we're going to have a victory. So you said you're in data analytics, yeah. right? Yeah. So as mentioned, we track everything. We yeah. have a whole analytics and like, yep. like it's a big thing. So like if you're wanting to get, say, into that, like one of the things you come with is like, hey, you know, a lot of that data in all of our games is actually streamed out. Like, come in with a project, like even if it's not our game or something else. Sure. Like, hey, even sports analytics. Sure. Right? Just show us like, hey, you know, this is what I do, this is what I bring to the table, this is how I can help be part of the team. Right? And it's uh, it's always great to show examples. And it doesn't matter um, what you do, you know, whether it's uh, data analytics or you're an HR yep. or, you know, it, it, it really doesn't matter. You come and you go, I have a passion for this, I have a passion for what you do, this is what I can bring to the team. And bringing the example is always really great because that then turns the question around your example, not us going, so, do you write code? Cool, yes. let's, yes, let's I do. here, I'll give you a problem, there's a whiteboard, <laughs> go, go do it, right? So Let's bring up another core value. Uh, embrace your inner geek. Yep. This is another one of our core values, it's around the orc. And uh, that is we look for people who have enthusiasm for whatever they do, right? And it's, al it's almost always a conversation starter. I'd be happy to talk to you about hockey or coffee or 3D printing in addition to game programming. Um, and there are great ways that people connect. And a lot of times your passion projects inform what you're going to do in your work projects. And so it's, it's really important. Uh, we love to hear about those things. Like, we look for that too. So, so really quick, we spent a lot of time answering questions like, let's cap the line and we'll try and get through everybody. Do we have something that's we'll, going to we'll kick us out of the building like the power grows off or anything like yeah. that? Not me. We okay. got locked in. <laughs> so so the, the last guy in line is maybe Yeah, the last guy in line is current last guy in line. We'll try and lightning round it, but we'll, okay. we want to get through your questions. So thank you. I we'll hope to see you across the table. Hope so also. Hi. Hi. Um, so when looking for an intern, is there yep. any difference between looking for an intern or for someone looking for a job position? Um, when do you start looking for interns and what's the best way to contact you? Okay. Hmm. Go for it. They're Dude. about to open up internships. I was just going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> like, for next year. So you want to get, as yep. soon as that door opens, you want to get your name in there. All internship contacts come through our university <laughs> relations department, not directly through us. So, sorry, we can't get anyone a job directly. You have to apply for it on the website. Um, they do open next month and they fill up right away. They close within a month or two. And then we make uh, intern selections early in 2019 for next summer. I think we have postings. Uh, last year we had over 100 interns, but we had many thousands of applications for them. So put your best stuff forward when you want to apply for it. Um, I'll give you a quick recommendation there. Uh, what Adam said, um, specialize your resume. A hiring manager, so I, I'm a tools engineer. I got 120. Um, intern, so three years ago I got 120 resumes for one intern spot. I literally, all the, all the horrible stuff you hear in uh, your college hiring stuff, is like, they won't even read your resume. I did read them. If you didn't say tools anywhere on it, I didn't give it another read, right? Like, especially if you want that job, make sure you say in the resume, I'm interested in this.